Well, as we continue to uh, prepare our hearts to receive God's word this morning, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Let's pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight. Lord, you are our rock, and you are our redeemer. And all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. Well, friends of Christ, uh, today we move into a new season on the church calendar. Uh, right? So we had Advent, which led us up to Christmas, and then we were just coming out of the Christmas season, and, and a new uh, season starts today. Anybody know what today is? You can look at the front of your bulletins if you want to cheat. What if, I think I heard it. Epiphany, right? Uh, it's Epiphany. Uh, epiphany is the time in the church calendar where we remember the story of the wise men, when the wise men came to pay homage to Jesus. I want to show you uh, where we're at in the liturgical calendar. So, uh, as I introduced, uh, I think five or six weeks ago, we are uh, letting the liturgical calendar kind of guide us all through the season of Easter. The liturgical calendar is something that's used by churches across the world. Uh, it's meant to keep you in the rhythm of the story of salvation, to keep you in the rhythm of the story of Jesus. Uh, and so uh, Christian New Year, as we like to call it, uh, is right up here in Advent, right? So uh, beginning there, we went through that. We have now gone through the 12 days of Christmas. Sounds familiar, right? 12 days of Christmas. Uh, now we enter here. It's not on this calendar. This is a very simple one. But today, uh, it marks the day of Epiphany. And we're moving into uh, Epiphany or Ordinary Time, as it says on this, uh, leading up to Lent. Uh, Holy Week and Easter. Uh, I'm going to be showing this kind of a couple of times as we walk through this. Uh, again, we do this just to help keep us in the rhythm of the story of salvation. Start at the beginning of the story of Jesus and go all the way through his death and resurrection. But today is Epiphany. Uh, we move out of Christmas and now we start to look at the life of Jesus. We start to say, okay, what comes next uh, in the life of Christ? Jim, I can't advance it. Can you go forward one for me? Okay, perfect. That's what I need. No, I just need a blank slide for now. Thank you. Um, so the wise men. Uh, we're told the story of the wise men uh, only in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, they don't actually appear in any other Gospel. So we're going to read this story together and walk through a couple of things. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I want to say one quick word. I think when we typically think about the visit of the wise men, uh, we, we typically picture them like being there with the shepherds, right? We have our nativity scenes, and we have the shepherds on one side, we have the wise men on the other, uh, and our, this has kind of convinced us in our minds that this all happened kind of at one time, that the shepherds and the wise men, they must have come the night that Jesus was born. Uh, but the truth is, that probably really wasn't the case. The wise men wouldn't have been at the manger the night that Jesus was born. Uh, they probably would have come much later. We don't really get any solid clues about when they would have come. It probably would have been within a year or two, based on some other things that we know. Uh, so we're not given a, an amount of time, and we're not given a lot of details about them, right? They're just simply called wise men, right? It doesn't even say three wise men in there. It just says they brought three different gifts, right? So we, we surmise a lot of things from this one passage, uh, and I'm going to ask us to kind of set that aside a little bit this morning. Uh, and see what exactly it is Jesus is trying to reveal to us through the story of the wise men. Because ultimately, the story uh, isn't about, you know, where they were from or what they were doing or how many or when they got there. This story is about Jesus and about what Jesus is doing as he is coming into our world. So I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 2. Uh, you can follow along uh, in Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to read the first 12 verses. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, a wise men, from the east, came to Jerusalem and asked, Who is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. 
In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. For many of us, this familiar story uh, carries with it the danger of sentimentality. Right? Uh, when I hear this story, I think of little kids in rows, right, with big staffs, walking down and saying their lines and laying their little treasures down. Uh, we can often kind of relegate the wise men to just these three nice guys who were bringing some expensive gifts and who followed the star that found Jesus. Uh, but this story, here in the Gospel of Matthew, it shows us so much more than that. So we can't really, like, just put it off to the area of sentimentality. Uh, to understand more of what's happening here, I want us to get to know a couple of people a little bit better. Uh, we're introduced to a couple of people in this story that we might know uh, a little bit, but I want us to get to know them better. And the first person we need to get to know is King Herod. Okay, King Herod plays a large role in this story, and, and we would be remiss if we didn't get to learn more about King Herod this morning. So King Herod, uh, he was a great an extremely powerful man during the time of Jesus. So he was uh, something that was called an underking or a client king for Caesar. Uh, so he had kind of jurisdiction over a certain area. Uh, and Herod was known for a couple of things. One of the things that Herod is known for is his massive building projects. Right? There was nothing too big or too crazy that King Herod wouldn't uh, take on. He, uh, he built an entire port, si uh, port city of Caesarea, uh, which included an entire harbor. Like He, he literally built an entire harbor system. Uh, he built Masada, maybe some of you have heard of. It's a fortress that's on the side of a mountain uh, that was intended to be the place where they could make a last stand if necessary. Uh, he built all sorts of elaborate and extravagant palaces. Uh, this is kind of what he was known for. Uh, there was one palace that sat outside of Jerusalem and outside of Bethlehem, up on a hill. Uh, today, this site of this palace is known as Herodium. Okay, uh, Herod, Herodium. Uh, it's the place where Herod's tomb is today, but back in the day, it was another one of his opulent palaces. Uh, and it's set up on a mountain, and it overlooks Bethlehem, and it overlooks Jerusalem. And now I want to show you this picture. So Kim, can we see this picture? Uh, so Amy and I had the chance to go to uh, Israel. And we visited Jerusalem. We visited Herodia uh, four or five years ago. Uh, and we took this picture, uh, and this is about halfway up the mountain. Okay, I don't know why we didn't take a picture from the top of the mountain, but we were tired. There was a lot of walking. Uh, so we took a picture about halfway up the mountain. You can kind of see the trail that we were walking on here. Uh, and down here, this is a valley that we're overlooking. So Jerusalem is like off here somewhere. Uh, but this, uh, these kind of collections of buildings, that's Bethlehem. Okay, so that's Bethlehem over there. Jerusalem is a little ways over here. Uh, we're about halfway up a mountain, uh, going up to where one of Herod's palaces would have been. Now, the reason I want to show you this picture is to give you a little bit of context on what's happening in our story and what's happening in the birth of Jesus. Herod has this great, big, opulent, giant palace that overlooks all the area in the countryside of Bethlehem. And it not only overlooks that, but it probably dominates the landscape. Right? So anybody in Bethlehem, 
anybody in the countryside, they would have been able to look up and be like, oh yeah, there's Herod. There's the palace. There's the power. There's the, the one with all the money. There's the one with all the strength. There's the one with all the glory. There's the one that we should worship. There's the one that we should really be afraid of. But what happens when Jesus is born and when these wise men come is you get a contrasting vision of kingdoms. Right? Jesus is literally born in the shadow of Herod's palace. He is literally born in the countryside surrounding uh, this display of Herod's power. And then these wise men come from the east. These important visitors come, and what do they say? Do they say, hey, Herod, you have a lovely palace. Can we know more about you? Can we spend some time with you? Hey, Herod, this is really great what you've done here. I'm really impressed by this. No. Wise men come, and they say, Hey, we've heard there's a king been born. We've heard there's someone who is worthy of our praise. We want to meet him. Do you know where he is? Could you possibly point us in the right direction? <clears throat> the kingdom of Jesus uh, is centered around a baby. Uh, a baby who is relying on his mother and father. Uh, a baby who is vulnerable, living somewhere in Bethlehem, living somewhere in this countryside. It's a stark contrast that we get right off the bat uh, of the kingdom of Jesus and the kingdom of Herod. The kingdom of Jesus is vastly different from the kingdom of Herod. Jesus is uh, bringing a kingdom to this world that is marked by vulnerability. It's marked by love and compassion and grace. And all the while, Herod is trying to build a kingdom that's all about power, it's all about money, it's all about fame. So bring this knowledge with you, okay? This is who Herod is. He's the guy who builds palaces up on the top of the mountainside so that everybody will have to look and see him and be thinking of him all the time. Can you can go to a blank slide. That's fine. Just the next one. Bring this knowledge of Herod with you to the story of the Magi. They come from the east and they ask to see a new king. And Herod is not happy, right? He is not happy. And did you notice when Herod is not happy, who else is disturbed? Everybody. <laughs> right? The people of Jerusalem are disturbed. That even gives him a little bit of insight, right? He was an unstable leader. He never quite knew what he was going to do. If he was upset, if he was, uh, if he was disturbed, then all of Jerusalem is disturbed with him. So... Herod is disturbed that uh, these magi, these important people, they're not here to see him. Uh, and the, the people of Israel, the people of Jerusalem, excuse me, are, they're actually right to be disturbed. Because after our passage for today, after Herod realizes he's been duped by the magi and they've gone home a different way, remember what he does next? He orders all, uh, all the boys under the age of two in the region of Bethlehem to be killed. Okay? That's the only time frame we have for the Magi's visit, right? He, he would have thought this baby would have been born sometime in that two-year time frame. But that's the kind of person Herod was, okay? Not just like a, a, a kind of sort of unstable. He was really unstable. He was really power-hungry. He ordered the killing of everybody under the age of two just to try and get rid of this one little threat to his power. And here come these Magi into Herod's kingdom. So we talked about Herod. Let's get to know the Magi a little bit more. Uh, the Magi, as, I, as I've mentioned, were rich, intelligent, prominent, powerful people who have traveled a long way. Uh, so their presence in Jerusalem and them actually being in Bethlehem, it wouldn't have gone unnoticed. Right? They weren't people who would have just kind of snuck in and, and people would have thought, oh, there's just another normal person. Right? They're coming from a totally different culture. A totally different place, bringing these very expensive gifts. Uh, and truthfully, we don't know much more about the Magi. We don't know if they were uh, kings, if they were astronomers. We don't know exactly what their profession was. All we know is that they're rich and they're important. And, and the key thing I want us to know about them this morning is that they were foreigners. They were from a different country. They weren't Israelites. They weren't part of the Jewish people. They weren't part of... Uh, who would have been understood to be God's people at the time. And understanding this, understanding that uh, the Magi are foreigners, they're outside the bounds of God's people, this gives us another glimpse into the kind of kingdom 
Jesus is bringing right at the beginning. Not only is it a kingdom that subverts uh, the power that tries to stand over it, but it's a kingdom that signifies that it's not just for a certain group of people. Jesus did not come into the world just to save the Jewish people. Jesus came for everyone. Jewish and Gentile alike. Jesus came for the whole world. The Magi are the first non-Jewish people to recognize him as Savior. In a way, they are our uh, spiritual ancestors, if you will, right? We, we, can, we, are, we are Gentile people. Okay? We are not of the Jewish faith. Uh, so if the Magi had not known, if Jesus had not come for everyone, we wouldn't be sitting here this morning. When the Magi come from the East, it tells us right from the start that barriers are being broken down in Jesus Christ. That borders are being crossed that wouldn't have been crossed before. That salvation and, and the love of God is going out to people who never would have been able to receive it before the person of Jesus Christ. So right at the beginning of Matthew, right there in chapter 2, he wants us to know that. He wants us to know uh, that Jesus is not just bound to a certain group of people. Matthew wants us to know, as one commentator puts it, that everyone is invited to God's party. Even those who have been traveling radically different paths. Think about the Magi again for a minute from a Jewish perspective. Think about them from an early, uh, an early Jewish Christian perspective, right? They were people of another religion, people of another culture, traveling from way off. They didn't hear about Jesus through the prophets, through the Old Testament, through the Hebrew scriptures. They didn't go to their local synagogue and say, oh, I want to know more about this, and then come to Jesus that way. They literally found out about Jesus by watching the stars. Right? What if somebody walked into our church today and said, you know, I saw a star and I'm really into uh, astrology and I've been reading the stars every day and, and it showed me that I'm supposed to be here. And it showed me that, that God is leading me here. Right? We would look at them and go, <laughs> what are you doing here exactly? I, we'd hold them at an arm's length. This is who the Magi are. They're stargazers. They're people of another faith, they're people from another country who don't know all the promises of Messiah, but they see this star and they're curious. And so they follow it. They, they follow this curiosity, they follow this urge to say, hey, you know, what is this? The wise men are often referred to as seekers. They're ones who are seeking truth, they're seeking light, and that seeking ultimately leads them to Jesus. I think today we like to limit uh, the ways that people can come to Jesus, don't we? I think we like to put nice boxes around how God works in this world. Uh, we like to think that the only way people can come to know Christ is through a certain prayer or a certain doctrine or a certain uh, gospel tract that you have given them uh, or, or whatever it might be, right? Fill in the blank. But right, here, right away, right in the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, we have people coming to Jesus by reading the stars. People from another religion, another country, who have no business uh, coming to see the King of the Jews, they seek Him out and they find Him anyway. And what does their curiosity ultimately lead to? I love this part of the story. They find Jesus, they find Mary and Joseph, and what do they do? They worship him. They bow down and they worship him and they present him gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. Curiosity, stargazing, interactions with a power-hungry king, it all led them to Jesus. So the question for us becomes, uh, what do we do with this? <laughs> what do we do with this story? How can we make the Magi not just three nice little figurines that we have next to our nativity scene? Well, the invitation I want to offer us this morning uh, is to let the Magi invite us to consider what the kingdom of Jesus looks like. What does the kingdom of Jesus look like? If, I, if we went down the rows 
and I asked you all that question, and asked you to actually give me an answer, we'd get a lot of different answers. Right? What does the kingdom of Jesus actually look like? Who's a part of it? What are those people doing? What are, what are the main heartbeats and rhythms of the kingdom of Jesus? We all have these preconceptions about what it means to follow Jesus and what Jesus calls us to do in the world. And I think this story invites us to expand those a little bit. Or at least it challenges us to think a little bit differently. Right? Because certainly we are among the Gentiles, right? We are among the Magi who have heard of Jesus. But I think we can also put ourselves in the place of the Jewish people. Right? Many of us here are people who have been Christians our whole lives. Right? People who have grown up with Jesus, people who have said, yes, this has always been a part of me. And we look at the world around us so easily and we say, why isn't everybody like this? You know, I'm great, I'm in, everybody else is probably out. Right? These are the categories that we create in our heads very easily and very quickly. I think this story challenges those a little bit. I think this story invites us to consider what does the kingdom of Jesus really look like? How does Jesus enter into our lives? How does Jesus enter into this world? What kinds of things uh, does Jesus reveal to others that, that we might not know about? Right? The Magi are these foreign sinners in the eyes of the Jewish people. Yet they come and they worship Jesus. They're guided by the light of Jesus. They're guided by the star. They get it. You know who doesn't get it in this story? Who's the first guy we met? Aaron. He's the guy who doesn't get it. The rich guy, the powerful one, the well-known one, the respected one, the feared one. All those things that, that we tend to value even today, right? We tend to value wealth and money and power and, and all this stuff. In the eyes of the world, Herod's got it all. He's fine. He's got it all figured out. But this story shows us a different way. Jesus is a different kind of king. And he came to bring a different kind of kingdom. So what about us? What does it look like for us? What does it look like for you to live in the kingdom of Jesus today? What does it look like to follow the example of the Magi? Uh, to, to continue to seek Jesus, to continue to follow that light. What does it look like for you to, uh, to put away the story of Herod? Uh, to put away uh, the, the value of, of power and wealth and might uh, and security and all that stuff. And to instead bring gifts and, and lay your life down and worship at the manger of a baby. Personally, I am thankful for the Magi this morning because they signify that Jesus came to save us. Jesus didn't come into this world just for people who have it all together. Jesus didn't come into this world just for a certain group or ethnicity. Jesus came to save the whole world. The promises of Jesus are true for you and me and our friends and our neighbors and everybody that we know across the world and everybody that we don't know across the world. That's the kind of kingdom that Jesus came to bring. And it is good. Amen? Amen. To Christ, let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for this kingdom that you have brought to this world. We thank you for being a God who moves into our lives uh, in, in unexpected ways, one who breaks down barriers, uh, one who uh, does not say uh, you, know, you have to look a certain way or, or be this kind of person to, to follow me, but instead one who offers an open invitation, uh, even to Magi even to, to stargazers from the east. God, we pray that you would give us hearts and minds to see you. We pray that you would give us feet uh, and, and lives that seek after you. Because God, we do seek you. And we do desire for your light to be made known in our lives. So we pray that you would take down uh, any divisions or any barriers that we'd like to create. Uh, and we, that you would instead, God, invite us to live in your kingdom. That you would invite us to be people of love, and of compassion, and of grace, and of mercy, just as you have been for us. We pray this all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people together said,
Amen.